Welcome to Speaking of Higher Ed, conversations on teaching and learning. I'm your host, Andrew Everett. This podcast is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation at Augusta University. We release new episodes the third Wednesday of each month in spring and fall semesters. This is episode 10. Please take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe. Our guest today is... Hi, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the uh, Program Director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Hey, Jeff, thanks for being with us so that our listeners can get to know a little about you. If you'll please uh, share briefly the professional path that led you to your current role. Yeah, uh, I'm a librarian by trade, and I started out at Valdosta State University doing e-resources and virtual services, uh, along with being a reference librarian. And one of the things that I was in charge of was our usage statistics and also access to all of the e-resources that were out there. Um, a few questions that I got while I was there in my first year were about um, multi-user access to particular ebooks that we had. And there wasn't really an easy way to find out if we had um, ways for students to access this more than one at a time, uh, but they knew as soon as midnight before an assignment hit, uh, because then all the students would be uh, converging on this ebook and suddenly they were denied access to it. And so I, I talked with uh, at least one of these professors about, okay, so why is it that people are accessing these ebooks at night? And they said, in order to save these students money, uh, they were using a library text as a textbook. And I, I thought that was interesting. I, I was seeing a lot of not just uh, educational inequality, but also income inequality at VSU. It was definitely holding students back. I was teaching a, a library course and seeing this myself. And so looking at one of these hidden costs that can often affect students like textbooks, I thought this is something that should be seen as more important than it is. Um, we had some discussions throughout our library system, Galileo, uh, about the MOOC craze as 2012 approached. And as it really uh, gained momentum, there was another discussion going on that I was a part of about making sure that if the state ever did fund the creation of these open online courses, that they'd be made open to everyone, um, especially to the USG folks who want to use these in replacement of a textbook. Uh, the same kind of thing that I was seeing with our e-resources. And so after a lot of discussions, uh, a big fair use case that was taking place at Georgia State, um, a lot of discussions among the uh, Regents Academic Committee on Libraries, there was a, a statewide decision to get something started on open textbooks, a way to uh, not only replace commercial textbooks uh, with something that's more affordable, but also uh, replace them with something that's more remixable and revisable. And so we got together as a pilot team, instructional designers, librarians, faculty, uh, all coming together with the uh, California State University system to form a statewide initiative like they did previously. And so, yeah, now um, I've been at this position in Affordable Learning Georgia ever since that pilot team stopped in 2014 and, and launched ALG as a, an initiative with some funding then. Uh, so, yeah, it's almost been 10 years. It's yeah, we're getting there. The past decade has flown by and yeah. COVID obviously skewed <laughs> time. Well, let's get into our topic for today, which is Affordable Learning Georgia and using open educational resources. So the first question I have is simple. What is Affordable Learning Georgia? So we started out as kind of a hub to guide people towards more affordable resources. Uh, folks did not know too much about open textbooks, and they knew even less about replacing things with library resources um, and about the both the open licensing and the lack of open licensing on no-cost and low-cost materials just out there on the internet. So we created basically a libguide of 
different guides towards how to find things, how to create them, how to make them more accessible to everyone. Um, trying to make sure that we're defining open, not just as open in terms of being free, but open in terms of being accessible by everyone, including people with disabilities uh, who use assistive technology. Um, we really did want to get people more active in this space. And we knew that time was going to be a factor. The faculty were already uh, over their workloads quite a bit. Uh, librarians were uh, doing so many other duties as assigned in their job descriptions that it was really tough to assist. So our first move was to create a, a series of grants for uh, all of our institutions. So not individual grants, not where we're just uh, giving somebody a stipend, but a grant that goes to the institution so that they can support a team in getting a particular plan done. Um, this is a complete opt-in kind of thing. If you were two mathematics faculty at Columbus State and you said, there's a really good resource out there on pre-algebra that could replace the text that we have, but we have to do a curriculum revision. We have to make sure that the OER that we're bringing in meet all of the learning outcomes that we want out of the course. Um, we also need to make sure that it's relevant to Columbus State students because this was made over at, say, MIT, and those students may have a, a very different path into getting into college and may have different uh, a different knowledge base that they're bringing in too. Um, so that's just part of it. And then you have to create all of the supplemental materials, right? Uh, often when you get a commercial textbook, uh, the students are footing the bill and then you get things like uh, an entire bank of lecture slides, which you probably are customizing anyway at that point, because you're going to teach the course the way that you want to teach it. Um, but in this case, you are often building them from scratch. So it's a discovery process from the beginning. It just takes a lot of time and a lot of collaboration. So we wanted to at least provide some funding that would uh, help with a course release or uh, some overload time or summer time uh, for folks to do this extra work to get these no cost and low cost resources into the classroom in such a way that uh, it either doesn't affect uh, the outcomes in a bad way or it improves them even more. Uh, so yeah, that, that was kind of our, our big push. So now ALG is not only a website in order to guide folks to particular affordable resources, but now it is a, a mechanism for action through funding uh, by these grants. And we can't mandate anything. We're not an organization that's going to say, all right, now all of you are going to teach with OpenStax Anatomy and Physiology. That's not how faculty work. Uh, that's not why we hire experts, right? And so um, grants kind of provide an opportunity for folks to find out about a funding opportunity. Then maybe they find out about OER and they're like, wow, hey, this is great. Um, let's put together a team. Let's get a plan together. It's a, it's a competitive process. So proposals come in and they are evaluated by peers and then they're evaluated by us. Um, so they are working on a plan. We're working with them on hopefully uh, perfecting that plan. And then when it's accepted, it's funded, and then more like, and then they could put some of that extra time towards uh, adopting open resources. So yeah, there's there's now the site Affordable Learning Georgia. There's the processes, and then of course there's the network of folks who are are like extremely experienced and informed um, on using open educational resources and library resources. Uh, all of our faculty, uh, champions, library champions, and design champions, um, at Augusta University, that's Andrew Goss and Melissa Johnson and Arthur Takahashi. And they are folks that meet with us every month and talk about new developments in the national open world, in, uh, in what's going on with our particular initiative, what's going on on their campuses and how they can overcome barriers that they're encountering. Uh, and just kind of a way for everybody to listen to each other and grow. Uh, quite a few champions meetings have resulted in big changes to either 
our resources, um, our grant program, the documentation that has to do with the grants. Like we're we're constantly growing and evolving alongside our champions as kind of a a giant steering committee of advocates. Uh, so yeah, then so we also have ALG the network. There's kind of three parts to what Affordable Learning Georgia is at that point. So uh, yeah, that's that's a quick run through of it. I could talk people's ears off about it for hours. Let's not do that. <laughs> so Affordable Learning Georgia has grown significantly in the past decade and is making an impact on all campuses across Georgia. So you touched on open educational resources that it's more than free or low cost materials. It's also materials that are accessible. And so is there anything else we need to cover to define open educational resources before we move further? Yeah, I think the significance of an open license is something that uh, everybody needs to know about. So let's say that you're on the Internet, you find something free, you'd love to use it for your course, but you don't know exactly who authored it. And you're not sure about the terms of service of it. And maybe it was a website that somebody spun up that has a whole bunch of great information about um, the, the physics of how light works. And maybe you want to make that into a lecture or a video or an animation. That would be really cool. But you don't know if you have the rights and if someone's going to chase after you for it five years down the line. Um, that's just kind of how U.S. copyright tends to work. You don't even have to register copyright. As soon as you make the thing and it's in what they call a tangible format, which means just about any digital format too, um, they immediately have the right and the exclusive rights to make copies to those things until at least they sign them over to a company. Uh, but Let's say that you made something free and you wanted somebody to go out and make that video and make that animation. And, you know, you're you're an instructor, like, please make use of this uh, in, in a way that makes a bigger impact. And in exchange, like you keep this license the same way so that others can build on the things that you made too. That's that's what open licensing is about. It puts those permissions right up front. You don't have to send anybody an email. Uh, you don't have to get a signed letter from someone with written express permissions of a publisher or something like that. When you create something and put an open license on it, you're telling someone, hey, guess what? You can make this as hyper relevant as you possibly want uh, for you and for your students and for exactly the way that you teach. So for us, that's Creative Commons licenses uh, in open education. That is the norm. Um, it's over at creativecommons.org. There's a nonprofit that oversees the whole thing. There's a legal document behind every open license that you put on something. And it's it's great to check that stuff over. Um, as soon as you put a Creative Commons license on something and you put it out there, that is an irrevocable license. It's going to be with that version of the thing that you've created um, legally forever. So there was... Uh, uh, an early attempt to monetize open textbooks by this company called Flat World Knowledge. And back in 2010 or so, they thought, yeah, let's make a series of open textbooks and we're going to have them open and hopefully they'll just buy the courseware after. They found out later that they weren't profitable, but they had these Creative Commons licenses on the texts. And so they said, well, we're going to close everything off. We're going to delete uh, the stuff from our servers, we're going to do something very different. They they make courseware now. Um, so they did delete all of those texts off of there and they put them behind a paywall. But because they had that open license, uh, folks already had the texts and they made them available through their own servers after that. Uh, they became the building blocks for some of the best open textbooks that we have today. Uh, the Sailor Foundation turned them into open courses. And from there, uh, folks uh, in California, folks at BC campus in Vancouver, uh, they transform them into new works uh, with much more current information. And so the uh, open licenses give the permission to do that. Uh, the, the one thing that's 
just something to think about is that when you're going to assign an open license on something, it's going to be there in perpetuity. Now that means caution for the creator, but that also means that you're, that you can kind of be fearless with those open resources when you revise them, because nobody's going to be able to just change their mind and come after you later. It, you always have permission to do that revision or to redistribute the entire text to everybody um, who's taking your course on day one. It's always going to be there. Interesting. So can you, you touched on this when you were you know, introducing yourself, um, but can you go on about describing the need for open educational resources in higher ed? Well, when we talk about it in the university system of Georgia, you know, we're coming from a public education standpoint uh, in a place where there's a lot, uh, there are a lot of folks who cannot afford to pay for college, maybe the way that my parents were able to. You know, I had some egregiously expensive biology and anatomy and art history textbooks. Uh, they, you know, weighed about 20 pounds in my backpack and they, my parents weren't happy about it, but they were able to fund it. There are a lot of folks where they do not know that they have these texts assigned to them. And then they go to their textbook uh, store, they go to the campus store, they go to the website, and they realize that they have to pay an extra $300 or $600 a semester. And that's going to completely trip them up in a way that it shouldn't. I mean, our idea for higher education is that access for everybody in Georgia is available and it's high quality. And you lose a bit of that quality if you're tripping over all of these extra costs that happen, like a hidden fee. Um, so th there is the affordability lens to open. That's super important and a big thing of what we do. We didn't call ourselves Affordable Learning Georgia for nothing. Uh, but there are other needs for having open resources in higher education that go beyond just saving students money. Um, a lot of the uh, digital resources that you've got out there that are commercial, they are all under all rights reserve protection, and they are written uh, by a certain company, uh, maybe by a particular author or a series of editors with a unified certain voice that may not be a voice that speaks to folks at your institution um, or ones in a particular career path. So it's, it's different to take fundamentals of biology if you're an allied health student than it is if you're going to be a straight up, I'm going to get my PhD in biology and go to a lab kind of biologist. Um, and because of that, uh, we have a remix of uh, open sex biology for allied health students. That's a, a really neat uh, like way of making something much more relevant uh, to the folks who are in your course. And that kind of remixability and customizability is a big part of open. There's also a practice uh, that's growing and growing called open pedagogy. And the idea is that it kind of lines up with critical pedagogy, right? Fighting the banking model of education and having students be generators of information and knowledge uh, right alongside the instructor. Um, students uh, can participate in the creation of educational resources, uh, maybe for other students who are going to come into the course. Uh, they can be the editors. Uh, they can also... Um, uh, collaborate on things and maybe even share out their own personal stuff as open resources that can be built upon too. Um, that kind of practice can get higher up in Bloom's taxonomy, right? Like now students are starting to synthesize the information that they're taking in personally, or they're starting to teach it to other folks. Like that's that's really neat when it happens. Of course, if you're going to do a practice like that, it's best to get permission uh, from students to make sure that they that they can opt into sharing their resources out with everyone. Uh, if it's too personal or if they are just not comfortable with it, they should be able to not do that as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's a it's a really neat. Uh, process that's starting to grow. So it's not just free. There's a lot more to open 
uh, once once you're in there. Uh, I think it's a it's a good entry point to think about affordability. And past that point, you start thinking about what you can do with it in a pedagogical sense. So how do faculty benefit from using open educational resources in a course? So, yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit about how um, how it can affect your pedagogy, right? Uh, how the idea of more malleable resources, at least from a legal standpoint, if not from a format standpoint, um, can help you out in making things more customizable. Uh, it can help in making them more relevant for the students that you're teaching. Uh, but there's also a network of folks who are building these, who are teaching with OER, uh, who are trying to better themselves using uh, open practices. And being a part of that network, I think is one of the hidden benefits uh, for joining the kind of open community. Um, but just like any discipline, there are, there are conferences on open. There's going to be one coming up in Canada for uh, the entire world. It's OE Global and it's happening uh, pretty soon. And um, our program manager, Nakita Afaha, is going to go to that, meet a whole bunch of faculty who are teaching with uh, these resources, uh, fellow instructional designers who um, are in a role like hers. And it's it's really an energizing community. It, it definitely not a place where people are trying to one up each other, or uh, being uh, somewhat confrontational. They really are a community that builds each other up and includes all voices. So it's it, it's really neat to see both a global community and then the national community um, through the Open Education Conference, which will be happening uh, a little bit later on. Uh, so yeah, there's. There's definitely a benefit to teaching with OER uh, in, in that kind of pedagogical space. There's also the, the point that if you're going to be transforming your course, you are now taking a, a huge reflective look at what you're, uh, what you're teaching with, how you're teaching it, and if it's effective. In a way, it, it makes it hard to research the effects of OER because you're always doing this big overhaul. You're doing reflective practices no matter what. Like that's that's already going to be beneficial. Um, but then there's also the connections that you start making uh, with other folks through doing these kinds of open practices too. Do we know how much money students in Georgia could save uh, when their courses use uh, open educational resources that are free or low cost? So it, it does depend on what course you're going to take. Um, for example, let's say that I was a music student at first. So I take a, a million courses that have no textbooks to them. I mean, yes, you have to go out and buy sheet music and that's just, that's under copyright no matter what, unless it's older and then it's under public domain. Um, but if you're taking your, your basic introductory courses, right, and your uh, introduction to biology, uh, your introduction to psychology, that type of thing, um, you're looking at some pretty expensive resources a lot of the time. Now, there are new ways uh, that even commercial publishers are making things more affordable. Uh, we're taking a look at quite a few of them, including inclusive access, which is an opt in uh, or faculty would opt into being in a program like that. Uh, students would get their resources on day one. Um, that would also be another way that students can save money. Uh, but when we're looking at our grantees uh, who teach a particular course and they have they have a good reason to transform it. Most of the time, they're looking at resources that are around an average of $130 per course um, that they are then going to uh, either save that entire amount or um, minus uh, about $40. Because if you do low-cost resources, the barrier uh, for teaching with low-cost resources is the total has to be uh, $40 or less. Um, so you're looking um, at uh, around like 90 to 130 per course. Now, things have changed a lot. Um, not only has um, have the price of textbooks started to uh, even off as opposed to growing about three times CPI, which is what we saw before the pandemic, uh, but CPI itself is starting to grow. We're starting to see every single 
price rise up a lot. And then we go to the grocery store and we go, what the heck has happened to the price of eggs, let alone the price of textbooks? So it's it's a bit different in 2023 than it was in 2018. Um, but as things start to even out again uh, with, that, with the pandemic kind of in our past, we'll start seeing where that price point lands. Um, I would say probably by 2024, 2025, we actually know where things are. But yeah, I would I would expect around 90 to 130 per course. If if a faculty member wants to develop their own open educational resources and not just looking for some that are available, they want to develop their own. What's their first step? So I think it depends on your your knowledge level up to that point. If you want to develop OER because you heard this podcast today, but you've never heard of OER before, you've never even looked for them. Uh, never gone to an open education conference or anything like that, I think the best first step would be to contact your champions. Um, here at, at Augusta, uh, Andrew, Melissa, and Arthur are amazing. Um, Melissa has been with us I, almost since day one, I think. Uh, there's also just a community of folks who do teach and learn uh, or who, who do some teaching and learning with OER uh, over at Augusta. Uh, Clement Albert, for example, has been doing amazing things with computer science and OER. Um, and that's how it is at any USG institution. There are amazing champions who can get you started. Um, you know, they'll, they'll probably start asking you questions about not just the courses that you're teaching and what you're teaching with at the moment, but, you know, who are you students and, and what, where do you see your particular kind of pedagogy improving and like affecting students in a better way than how you're teaching with the resources that you're using? Because this isn't just about saving money. It's also about improving um, just overall. So, yeah, I, I think that contacting champions would be the first thing. And this will make it a lot easier uh, to you're either going to have to search by yourself or search with uh, folks that can help you to make sure you're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, you know, writing an entire introductory uh, algebra and trigonometry textbook right now, I mean, that is that is a heavy workload. And then OpenStax has, you know, multiple editions of it with a double-blind peer-reviewed uh, panel behind it for introductory algebra and trigonometry. You would want to make sure that um, that you're not only just creating something original, but also that there isn't something out there that could help you out as you're creating this new original work. So yeah, I think Champions would be the best guide uh, for that. Okay, and how do low cost and no cost educational uh, materials promote equity in education? So I'll talk a little bit about a study that came out of the University of Georgia. On our pilot team uh, was Eddie Watson. He was one of the uh, instructional design leads over at the UGA Center for Teaching and Learning. And he had been engaged in OER work before a lot of us were. Uh, they got a Gates Foundation grant a while back, and they were exploring using, uh, in particular, OpenStax published textbooks um, at UGA, uh, particularly with super sections of a course. They uh, started out with a cohort of instructors. They had uh, the data about their um, learning outcomes and how they were, like how students were doing in their course before they made the transition to OER. And then after they made the transition to OER, they also had disaggregated data on the students who were in the course. So they weren't just looking at student success overall, but they were looking at how particular students succeeded or didn't or did they not change at all um, when they made that OER transition. And what they found was that, yes, uh, all students seem to improve a little bit in that transition to OER. And you might be able to chalk that up to just educational improvements overall as uh, instructors do an entire overhaul of the course. But the big changes that they saw were disproportional changes 
uh, with Pell eligible students as opposed to non Pell. Um, with people of marginalized races and ethnicities as opposed to those who were not, and part-time students as opposed to full-time students. So there was a little bit of a raise uh, when you saw the OER course implemented with these same instructors. But the big difference happens um, with the folks who are most affected uh, by equity programs. So that means a lot of things uh, for, for OPEN. And one of them is that if you're going to analyze the effects uh, of teaching with open educational resources, one of the things you'll need to do is account for who is affected by increased access to resources the most. Um, so if you have disaggregated data on your students, not just their grades, uh, that can help you out in analyzing whether or not that success um, went to the people who needed it the most. Well, as we wrap up, I do want to ask our continuing the conversation question, which is what are some strategies for overcoming common challenges and barriers when adopting or creating open educational resources? So the first one is really to connect with open uh, and connect with OER folks. Uh, Spark, which is at sparc.org, they run a Google group that functions as a listserv. Uh, it's a forum on open educational resources. And there's just everybody who leads programs, people who teach with OER, uh, librarians who help people find OER, copyright specialists, even uh, a few lawyers here and there, including uh, some scholarly communications folks over at Emory that provide amazing guidance and have their Juris Doctor. Like, just amazing folks um, who can help out when someone runs into a barrier like that. Um, our site has quite a few things that we've created because we knew there were barriers out there. One of them is that when you're uh, looking at a new resource, you might think to yourself, okay, well, is this high quality or not? How do I know? Uh, we created a set of selection criteria for high quality materials that we kind of took it from both BC campus, one of the, the biggest uh, OER organizations out in Vancouver, Canada. And we took it from Quality Matters uh, and their rubrics for evaluating online resources. And you, know, you can then have a rubric that you can start assessing your open resource with. Uh, the Open Education Network, which, is, uh, which has the Open Textbook Library, they also do uh, reviews based on a rubric. And you can go in and check a lot of the curated textbooks that they have. You can see uh, reviews from folks who share their name and their title and exactly where they teach. Um, and their evaluations of the text that they uh, either read through or used in their course by a whole bunch of different uh, criteria. So quality is a tough one to deal with because it is personal. Uh, it is in some ways uh, subjective. But if you can find a, a good tool to evaluate uh, your resources with, that's a good way to get started on what faculty often perceive as the quality barrier. Now, the time barrier, that's a tough one, uh, especially now, like the pandemic threw a whole bunch of responsibilities on folks that they were not prepared for. Uh, and now that we are kind of in this hybridized world and we're, uh, you know, folks are turning over here and there uh, above them and strategies are changing over and over again. Like there, it's hard to find that time. Um, the way that we're trying to do that is our grant program, but we're also just trying to make open educational resources easier to find um, and easier to use too. That's why we opened up our instance of Manifold uh, which is also known as OpenALG, which has uh, digitized open textbooks that are web readable, that are accessible right out of the box. So those particular texts, you would have to do hopefully less work on them uh, to make them ready to be uh, read and annotated and highlighted by your class. Um, so yeah, I, I think that time is a big one. The quality barrier is, uh, 
a really big one and a really subjective one that requires tools. But the biggest thing that you can do to overcome these barriers is to connect with folks. And really that does start with your champions and then joining the, the greater open education community. Great. Well, I do want to go back and, and mention again for Augusta University faculty interested in open educational resources and affordable learning Georgia. We do have uh, three individuals on campus, as Jeff mentioned, that you can reach out to with specific questions. You can find their contact information on our show page. And in fact, for all uh, University System of Georgia institutions, you can find your campus champions on the Affordable Learning Georgia website, which is also linked on our show page. Jeff, thank you for this great conversation about Affordable Learning Georgia and open educational resources. Uh, What platforms can listeners connect with you on? Uh, And thanks for having me, Andrew. It's it's really great to get Affordable Learning Georgia out there. We really want as many folks to know about ALG and about open resources as possible. Uh, it, if, you, if you're listening to this and you think, ah, I don't, I don't know enough for this, I'm not sure if I'm you know, good enough to apply for a grant, like absolutely, yes, we want your ideas. Uh, that is super important to us. Uh, but if you have any questions for me specifically, I'm at jeff.galan at usg.edu. And uh, I was on Twitter, but I am no longer on Twitter. Uh, so just search for my name in LinkedIn and I'm right there. Um, our program director is Nakita Afaha. That's N-A-K-I-T-A, uh, A-F-A-H-A <laughs> at usg.edu. And she's also on LinkedIn as well. Wonderful. Thank you. And I also want to thank our listeners. Please take a moment to rate, uh, review, subscribe, and share this episode of Speaking of Higher Ed. You can find the resources we discussed today on our show page at augusta.edu forward slash innovation. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash A-U-G-C-I-I. You can also email us at cii at augusta.edu. Speaking of Higher Ed is produced by the Center for Instructional Innovation here at Augusta University.